So in this last set of videos, we're going to look at the classification of uh, compact Lie algebras. Um, we've already seen two weeks ago that we can nicely encode compact Lie algebras of rank R in terms of their root system, or even simpler, in terms of the simple roots, which is a collection of R vectors that sp spans the R-dimensional space. Um, and in turn, these simple roots can be encoded in the Cartan matrix, which really keeps track of the inner products of the simple roots. Now, what we're going to use um, today is a representation of this Cartan matrix in a graphical form that will be particularly convenient to look at the classification. And this is the so-called Dinkin diagram Um, which in the case of uh, a rank R Lie algebra is a, a graph with R nodes. So this contains exactly the same information as the Cartan matrix, so it uniquely specifies a compact Lie algebra. So let's uh, just give an example here. So let's look at SO5. Um, if you remember, this has rank 2 and dimension uh, 10. Its root system, we have looked at two weeks ago. Um, it looks like this. So we have a total of eight roots. So by definition, these live in the two-dimensional plane corresponding to the eigenvalues of the two Cartan generators, H1 and H2, such that we have a total of uh, 10 generators corresponding to the dimension of this Lie algebra. Then we found that there are two simple roots, which are these two, which we can denote alpha hat 1 and alpha hat 2. And all other uh, roots could be obtained by uh, vial reflections of these roots. And the corresponding uh, Cartan matrix, well, it always has twos on the diagonal. And then for the off diagonal components we have to look at the inner products of these two uh, vectors and they give exactly a minus one and a minus two. So the Dinkin diagram corresponding to this Cartan matrix will be a graph on two nodes. So a node for each of the um, roots. And okay, the edge is going to encode the inner product between these two roots. So let me explain in a bit of detail how we associate a Dinkin diagram to uh, a root system. So here's the definition. Uh, the Dinkin diagram of a root system um, is the graph um, with a node, a node that's really a vertex, and we can label them, if you like, um, by a label i for each simple root alpha hat i, 
and edges connecting them determined by the values of the Cartan matrix. And the edges determined by so let's uh, tabulate the possible values of the Descartes matrix. Um, so if we look at the values uh, at the i and j position and the j i position, then we have seen that they can only take four different uh, pairs of values. Either they're zero both are minus 1, minus 1, minus 2, or minus 1, minus 3. So what we're going to do in that case is that we're going to draw an edge between the nodes that are labeled i and the nodes labeled j depending on these values as follows. So if the off-diagonal component uh, vanishes, then we do not put an edge. If they are equal to minus 1, we put a single edge. If we have minus 1, minus 2, we put a double edge. And if there is a minus 3, we put a triple edge. And then we still would like to distinguish um, uh, which of the, the indices i or j has the minus 3 and to this end uh, we put an arrow on the edge in these two cases. So this is the rule. So let me summarize the rule in words. Um, it is saying that these nodes are connected if the inner product of uh, i, i root and a j root is non-zero, so if they're not perpendicular to each other. Then we put a number of lines, so the number of lines is equal to the length of the root uh, j divided or squared times the length squared of root i. Um, well this is assuming that uh, well, the length of uh, j is well, the larger one among the two. Otherwise, we interchange the roles of i and j. And then we put an arrow towards the shorter root. And actually this is easy to remember because you can think of this arrow as a, as a uh, greater than symbol. Right, so it's saying that the j root is greater than the i root. So that is saying that the norm of the j root is larger than the norm of i. Well, in the case of a single edge, they're of the same length. Okay, so this is a definition of a Dinkin diagram that we can associate to any root system, so in particular to any compact Lie algebra of rank R. So for us, classifying compact Lie algebras is really going to be equivalent to classifying graphs with these types of edges classifying Dinkin diagrams. Um, now the first thing we want to do is to 
slightly reduce the uh, the set of uh, Lie algebras that we would like to classify. In particular, we would like to divide these Lie algebras into uh, um, the, the smallest possible components, the smallest uh, undivisible uh, components, which are the simple um, Lie algebras. So I've mentioned this term, simple Lie algebras, a couple of times before. So let me finally give a uh, formal definition of what it means for a Lie algebra to be simple. The definition. A Lie algebra G is said to be simple if um, it has no non-trivial invariant subalgebras. Okay, so here I should clarify um, some terminology. So we already know what a subalgebra of a Lie algebra is, right? So a subalgebra of Lie algebra. This is saying that if I take the commutator of two elements of this uh, this linear subspace H, that well, it closes. So meaning that all such commutators will be in H again. Now, an invariant subalgebra, it's a slightly stronger condition than being a subalgebra. It is saying that if I take any commutator of an element in the Lie algebra, so any generator, with a generator in this subspace H, that I want the result to be in H again. Clearly, this is a stronger statement than that one. Uh, and what do I mean by non-trivial? Well, this is saying that, okay, we always have some invariant subalgebras, namely the, 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 the algebra that only has the zero element or the full algebra G. And by non-trivial, we mean that this is not just the zero element and it's also not the full Lie algebra. Um, now, in the case that we do have an invariant subalgebra, what we can do is, is we can decompose our Lie algebra G into H and its complement. So there is there are smaller components uh, from which we can build our our Lie algebra G. So therefore, it makes sense to restrict our attention to simple Lie algebras. And we'll see this um, uh, precisely in a minute. Now, when I um, write down this definition, this may sound uh, uh, familiar to you, this terminology. Um, in particular, it sounds very familiar um, to the definition of irreducibility of a representation. Now, this is not a coincidence. Um, because the requirement that the Lie algebra is simple is really equivalent to saying that the adjoint representation is irreducible. So, adjoint representation of G is irreducible. Why is this? So because if I have a invariant subalgebra H, then I claim that this H, so it's a linear subspace of G, so and G in the in the um, adjoint representation is really the vector space on which my algebra is represented, this H is also going to define an invariant subspace there. Because 
um, so let's let's check this if I have two generators X and Y and I act with X on the state labeled by Y in the adjoint representation we know that this is given by the commutator of X and Y so that means that if we take um, X in G and Y in H then the commutator of X and Y is going to be in H again that's what it means to be an invariant subalgebra so that means that this is going to be in H for all these choices but that is just now saying that H is an invariant subspace for the in for the adjoint representation. So requiring that there are no non-trivial invariant subalgebras is the same as requiring that there are no non-trivial invariant subspaces for the adjoint representation. So that is really saying the adjoint representation is irreducible. Okay, um, so here is a nice fact and you're gonna um, prove part of this in the exercises. Um, if G is compact remember G compact it means that the Cartan killing metric of G is negative definite then um, any uh, any such compact Lie algebra it decomposes into simple Lie algebras so this is G1 direct sum up to GK where these G1 up to GK are simple compact V algebras. Um, so this is really the, the analog of the statement for um, reducible representations that one can write them as a direct sum of uh, irreducible representations. So here we're saying if we have a not necessarily simple compact Lie algebra, it decomposes as a direct sum of simple compact Lie algebras. And this decomposition is actually very nicely represented on the level of Dinkin diagrams because it corresponds exactly to the connected components so this is the decomposition of the Dinkin sorry Dinkin diagram into connected components so in particular a um, simple compact Lie algebra has a connected Dinkin diagram so every node is connected to every other node through some path of edges and if I look at the direct sum of two uh, Lie algebras then at the level of Dinkin diagram that just corresponds to this taking their, their, their disjoint uh, union of these uh, graphs just putting them next to each other so if we want to classify simple compact the algebras 
then we want to understand the connected Dinkin diagrams. So the case of rank 2 is quite simple now because then we have two vertices um, so they well, can only be connected through uh, one of these three types if you want them to be connected um, so there are exactly three of them so we have this one the double edge and the triple edge Notice that the, the orientation here does not matter because this is a symmetric um, graph without the, the arrow. Um, and we already know which Lie algebras these are. Uh, we've seen this uh, two weeks ago. So this is SU3. So that was the topic of last week. This is SO5. The example shown above. And this is the exceptional Lie algebra called G2. So these are all compact, simple Lie algebras of rank 2. So the question we will answer in the next video is, uh, for larger rank, what are the allowed graphs? So which graphs so, uh, what, what, what may a general graph look like? So we can have any number of uh, points. They can be connected, maybe with double edges, who knows. something like this. Maybe I have a triple edge somewhere. So which of these graphs um, uh, correspond to Dinkin diagrams of root systems? This will be the main question. Now, the nice thing is that the only thing we have to check is that for each of these nodes, we can find a vector in our dimensional space, a simple root. And these vectors have to be linearly independent and satisfy the, uh, the, the relation that is prescribed by the Cartan matrix. Um, so it is sufficient to check whether um, there exist linearly independent vectors which will be simple roots um, with the prescribed um, angles between them and length ratios prescribed lengths and angles but the lengths and the angles, um, they are uniquely specified by you know, the, these inner products that we write up there. So since the diagram specifies the Cartan matrix, it specifies all lengths. Well, we said that um, the lengths are not exactly specified when I have uh, uh, zeros. So when two roots are perpendicular to each other, then 
Uh, the value in the Cartan matrix does not specify the ratio of lengths. But since we're exactly looking at connected Kinkin diagrams, um, we know that we can go from any uh, node to any other node through edges. And each of these edges is going to determine the ratio of the lengths of the roots corresponding to them. So for all pairs of, of uh, roots, the diagram specifies the appropriate ratio of lengths. And for each adjacent pair of uh, roots, the angle, well, uh, well, actually for any pair of roots, the angle is specified by the type of edge that connects them or does not connect them. So in the next video, we're going to see what the consequences of you know, this criterion is on the type of graphs that are allowed.